So good morning. I'm Benjamin. This is uh, Charles. Um, thank you very much. Um, just as a background, um, our background is in capital investment and, and media. And Charles and I, three years ago, um, decided to look at the sector of education. And we saw in education the signs of digital disruption. Um, and the, the very same signs that we saw 10 years before in the media industry. So we, we basically decided to do something about it. And what we did is that we created a platform called EdTech Europe um, to be the voice of uh, European EdTech technology, education technology, with the aim to attract more investments to education technology in Europe, to reward uh, talent, uh, to identify world movers and shakers, and also to connect the ecosystem to create a strong education technology ecosystem in Europe. So today, we're going to, oops, sorry, we're going to present you uh, 10 insights um, on the European education technology uh, ecosystem, um, and hopefully you will enjoy it and be interested in the sector. And I'll hand over to Charles for the first insight. Right. Can you help me? <laughs> Going to next slide. Yeah, one more, that's going to be interesting. Here you go, 10 EdTech Insights. Good, well, um, thank you, Benjamin. Um, the question I guess it starts with in terms of uh, why we are all here as it relates to uh, education technology, which is why Benjamin and I wanted to uh, give this presentation. And the key to it is that uh, we see this as a, an area that is going to be hugely uh, disrupted over the coming years. And just to give you a sense of kind of uh, the relevance of this, John Chambers, who is the CEO of Cisco, said uh, that uh, the next big thing, uh, uh, killer application in the internet is going to be education. Uh, education is going to be so big that it will make uh, email just a rounding error. So you get a sense of kind of the opportunity. And here on the screen, uh, what you can see is just some comparatives with different parts of the market in terms of spending. Um, media and entertainment uh, on uh, the left-hand side uh, has an spend of about 1.4 billion, uh, so, <coughs> so not 1.4, 1,400 billion uh, 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 dollars per year. Uh, this compares to the global software industry of about 2,400 uh, billion. And then you look at education, which is three, uh, more than three times the size of the media and entertainment sector. So 1.42 uh, uh, trillion uh, dollars. So this is a huge industry, and so if you look at kind of disruption, if this is disruptive, the impact is going to be dramatic. So what we're trying to talk about today is, is how that's going to happen, why it's going to happen, and why we should pay attention. Benjamin. So we know it's big, so the question is how far we are in the digital transition cycle. Um, and so what we observed is that this is just the beginning. And to prove the point, um, what we did is that we looked at the share of digital spend in most content industries, so music, gaming, TV, uh, movie, publishing. And it's roughly today 35% of those content industries that is digital. For education, we are just at 3%. So we are at the very beginning of digital transition. And what it means is that the headroom for growth is huge. It's probably 10x from 3% to 35%. The question is, how long will it take? Five years, 10 years, 20 years? And to answer that question, it's very difficult to predict. But we need to look at what are the obstacles in the ecosystem uh, for a fast digital transition. If you look at the technology, actually most of the technology used by um, education technology or e-learning is already well adopted in other, in other industries. If you talk about SaaS platforms, talk about gamified content, digital delivery, all this is already well adopted in, in other industries. So technology is not going to be the problem. Is it about consumers? 
um, you know, if you look across Europe, most parents, teachers, students are embracing um, uh, e-learning. So, you know, the obstacle is not there either. Is it about policy or, or, or government? Most of the government and the policy are driving forward the education technology agenda with pretty ambitious uh, program to buy tablets for schools, for example. So, you know, it's not about technology, it's not about consumer, it's not about um, a policy that could be an obstacle for fast digital transition. So what could it be? And the, the true is issue, and especially in Europe, is actually uh, related to the ecosystem. There are more than 3,000 e-learning companies in Europe. Most of them are under-resourced and under-capitalized. Most of them have good products, but because they are under-resourced and under-capitalized, they don't have a market impact. When you are an uh, e-learning or education technology startup, you have to deal with schools, you have to deal with governments, and those are very difficult clients. If I take an example, if you're in the UK, if you want to sell a product, you have to do door by door to sell uh, your product to schools. If you are a net tech startup in Germany or in France, you might need to do a contract with the government. In both cases, it's a nightmare. And so what really is missing in the ecosystem in Europe is scale and marketing power. And that's a problem because that's what will slow the adoption of education technology. And it turns, it also has an impact on uh, the investments and the capital invested in the education technology ecosystem. And I hand over to Charles who's gonna talk about it. So what we are dealing with is really the lack of investment. That's what we see as the real challenge uh, in this marketplace. And why is that important? Well, you've seen the scale of the, of the industry, and what the thing that we want to bring out is the fact that uh, when we look at the European marketplace, uh, Europe is really lying some way behind other major uh, economic areas of the world. And what this slide seeks to do is just to give you a sense of what has been invested uh, into businesses uh, in the education technology sector. Now, what this does is give us a flavor of the attention that is being made by both uh, investors, but also the ecosystem that supports that investment. And what we can see is that um, in the US, where if you compare the student population of, say, the US to that of Europe, the US has about 100, uh, sorry, about 80 million uh, uh, students. Uh, Europe has more than 100 million students. So in terms of from an a, a, a addressable market, Europe is a much bigger addressable market than the US by comparison. But when you look at the amount of funding that's going into the market, what you discover is that from 2007, where we've been monitoring the data, there's been about just short of $6 billion that's been invested into education uh, technology businesses in the US. About a tenth percent of that is the amount that's been invested in Europe into the same type of businesses. So there is a tenfold difference in the level of attention that EdTech in Europe is getting compared to the US. You also look at the Asian markets, and again here, uh, you see that the level of investment is significantly higher than what's being done uh, in Europe. Now this is, is very important because uh, from our perspective, this is where the shift uh, needs to happen. We need to elevate the voice within this market and bring more attention into it because there is no shortage of entrepreneurial activity but what it needs is the fuel to drive that. So I think what we want to move on to is now looking at some of the global factors that why this is important. So digitization is an opportunity um, which we all recognize give, gives global uh, 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 opportunity, gives global marketplace, and education and training uh, is very much in that same vein. And in that context, what's important is to understand uh, kind of where that opportunity lies and where some of that um, uh, growth exists. And if you look at this particular slide, what this uh, seeks to do, which links into a lot of the other commentary that you've heard uh, today and, and yesterday, is the fact that uh, we are living in a very digitally connected universe. And what's more, that is spread uh, across the globe. And here, what you see is that by 2017, it's estimated that the emerging parts of the world will be more digitally connected uh, than uh, uh, the existing mature markets. So we're in an environment where there is a global opportunity, we're globally connected, and education is something where 
uh, the, particularly the Western world, has had a huge advantage in, in history, but that is something which, as per the example of the level of investment, if we're not careful, the investment will not be there to drive this particular energy. Now, if we look at it in terms of kind of the, the kind of student populations, you also see some quite interesting uh, uh, statistics, which is that in this slide, we're just looking at uh, tertiary education, higher education, but this is true for other areas of the market as well. And if you go back to 1990, which is not so long ago, what you'll notice is that actually the level of student populations enrolled in tertiary education were very similar across Asia, North America, uh, and Europe. But over the period since 1990, there's been a dramatic increase in the in Asian uh, uh, student population. And this huge kind of growth is driven by the fact of a desire to improve the skills and capabilities uh, of uh, the population. And in turn, that is driving a demand for education and again, a demand for technology which helps make that more efficient and uh, more powerful. So where we sit today is I think it's very evident that there is already huge spend, there is a population that's demanding education and that it's growing very fast, and it's a very global opportunity. And it's something that if we don't recognize now, we'll miss out on this, on this particular case. So Charles just mentioned that um, digitization accelerates globalization. And so the question is, who will be the, 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 the players who call the shot globally uh, in education? And you know, to our view, the, the gatekeepers are, uh, or the future gatekeepers are the people on platforms that are going to be gatekeepers between content and audiences, and content and consumers. And if you do a parallel with you know industries that we know very well, um, such as you know the music industry or the media industry or the movie industry, if you think of the iTunes, the Twitters, um, the uh, Netflixes, the Facebooks, they're all platforms, right? And w what they do very well is that there are actually two things. They, are, they have a social element, there are communities of content creators, there are community of influencers, um, uh, or, or um, uh, recommenders of content, and they have also uh, a programmatic dimension, um, which basically makes an algorithm uh, much more uh, efficient and relevant in terms of curating content, in terms of uh, distributing content, and in terms of recommending content. And will the same apply to education? We believe that yes, we believe that the winners will be uh, people who are playing in, um, I with those two dimensions, so uh, having a social platform and a programmatic platform. There are already businesses, you might have heard of Newton, for example, which is an uh, adaptive learning business, which is you know, programmatic, which matches basically content with um, um, knowledge gaps and students, so they are definitely in the programmatic area. Uh, you might have heard of Test Global, which is the largest network of teachers, a social network of teachers, and the power of a s large social network of teachers is very important to endorse and recommend content. So the same trends are happening. And I guess the question is, will there be a European player that will be well positioned to uh, play in that you know, global, global um, uh, education economy? And so far, no. Um, and do we want tomorrow to be uh, all the dominating uh, global players in education to be either American or to be either Asian? Do we want to create uh, European champions in education? I think the answer is yes. Um, and so that's why investing in the sector and starting to innovate in the sector is very important and supporting this innovation is very important. So, you know, we, we shared a couple of insights uh, on, on the sector at large. Now, we we'll, would we'll like to make a, a, a dive into a, a specific segment. There are three specific segments in, in education education technology. One is called the K-12 to market, which is from zero to 18 years old. The other one is um, the higher education, which is mostly university, and there is also the corporate learning. And I'll spend a bit of time on, on the K-12 market now. So the, the world of K-12, um, it's an interesting market because um, the K-12 market is probably the most difficult to crack. It's a very fragmented uh, market. Uh, most markets are very national, they all have their own curriculum, they all have uh, downward pressure on their budgets uh, because they mostly depend on, on state budgets. So it's probably the most challenging um, uh, uh, fragmented market that exists in uh, education technology. But yet, there is a very clear path of disruption that is common to all markets, all K-12 markets around the world. And this, this path of disruption can be summarized uh, as follows. It's, you know, the development 
um, of uh, tablets and uh, smartphones in classrooms um, or allowing a, a more data-rich experience um, and that in itself enable what we call the personalization of learning. And that's a clear path of disruption in, 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 in the K-12 market. And just to understand uh, the importance of uh, smartphones and tablets, they're important for a couple of reasons. The first one is that uh, tablets and smartphones are much cheaper to operate than PCs in a classroom environment, in a school environment. What that means, it means that it, free, it frees budgets from schools, because don't forget that schools are operating or you know, education is operating under strong budget constraints. And so it frees budgets that can be reinvested in the ecosystem and especially in software and digital content. So that's the first reason why they are important, why the development of tablets and smartphones are important for education. The second, and that's probably the most important, is because the, the level of engagement is so high, so kids really like um, tablets and, and, and smartphones, they are very engaged on them, that more and more uh, schools are allowing them in the classroom. But it's even pushing further, it's about not necessarily having tablets and smartphones in the classroom, but it's having the classroom in the tablets or in the smartphone. And I was reading the other day a statistics about that was saying that there are more kids in the world that have access um, to um, mobile internet that have access to school. And so as a result, it's not about mobile phone or tablets to be in schools, it's about schools to be in the tablets. And I think that's fundamental because once you have created, once you bring the school curriculum content in tablets and smartphones, you basically expand um, the, 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 the shelf life of education and schools, you know, in the classroom but also outside the classroom. You make your experience much more data rich, you allow um, a feedback loop, you allow personalization of content and you allow personalization of learning. And that's why it's clearly disruptive in, in the K-12 market. Um, so, you know, we talked about the K-12 market, we talked about the disruption, I wanted to talk about uh, as well higher education. Um, in higher education, the disruption is driven by in education by MOOCs. So who has heard about MOOCs in the, in the room? Okay. So MOOCs mean uh, massive online open courses. Uh, who has already um, enrolled on a MOOC in the, in the room? Okay. Who has completed a course <laughs> on a MOOC? <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> Very good. So, you know, MOOCs are, are, are interesting because when we talk about e-learning, people think about MOOCs and that's the only thing that they think about because that's probably the, the, the tip of the iceberg. They got a lot of hype. You probably know Coursera, for example, which is the most famous uh, US MOOC. And, and, but so, you know, they get all the hype, but they also get a lot of criticism. Uh, and the criticism tends to gravitate around the content is poor, um, the completion rates are very low, and so they are not really efficient. And, you know, I think you need to remember, uh, for example, if you draw a parallel with YouTube at the beginning of YouTube back in 2005, you know, the content was really poor as well, but it ended up doing very well. So I think, you know, focusing uh, the criticism on the MOOCs is unfair and it's missing the entire point. The point about MOOCs is that they are the best tool to drive mass market adoption for e-learning. And that's fundamental because they basically make the market of e-learning on, on a global basis. And just to give you um, a, an overview of the, the consumer demand or the interest for MOOCs, I did a, a comparison on Google Trends. So I looked at the number of search for Coursera, which is the, um, uh, the most uh, you, you know, famous US MOOC. And I compare that with, uh, I guess, the most famous European universities, Oxford and Cambridge, who have uh, 800 years of history. And it took five years to Coursera to get the same appeal than brands in education created 800 years ago. So just think about this for a second, wh wh what this means and how disruptive it is. Now, you know, I don't have a crystal ball and I'm, I'm not able to fast forward this, but if you take a parallel with what happened, for example, in the media industry and you take another famous uh, English brand or European TV brand and you compare that to what happened uh, with YouTube, you see what's the difference, right? And I, and, and I can guarantee that five years from now, the slide I just show you will look like this. So, you know, yes, MOOCs are not perfect yet, but they drive massive adoption and that's the key. And I have no doubt that um, they, they, they will improve. If you look already at the 
at the kind of economical equation of economic equation of MOOCs, yes, completion rates are very low compared to normal courses, and there is a lot of criticism. But in terms of cost, the cost of delivering one more student, one more course to one more student, is much, much, much lower. And that's what's disruptive about MOOCs, is the ability to uh, deliver on a global scale high-quality education. That's what uh, uh, is disruptive. So, you know, we talked about uh, disruption in K-12, we talked about disruption in um, higher education, and, you know, it's very difficult to measure the impact of those technologies on those two sectors, because, you know, efficiency or efficacy in those sectors are usually measured by indicators that are lag indicators. So, you know, we probably get a better idea, you know, 10 years from now, whether that has an impact on uh, student debt, youth unemployment, uh, various, you know, liter literacy rates. So it's very difficult to measure, and I think that's one obstacle of the development of education technology. But there is a third segment, which is the corporate learning segment, where the, the efficiency and the efficacy of corporate uh, learning technology is much more measurable, because you can measure that from a PNL impact. And I, I, I want Charles to tell you a few words about this. Thank you. Um, so the, the importance of the corporate and vocational market is that, uh, as Benjamin said is that it, it probably gives us a window on some of the activity that's happening in this space. Corporates obviously have a profit motive that drives uh, their desire for using training to improve efficiency within an, uh, an organization. In education, it's a more complex kind of ecosystem because you have the student who probably is the most technologically aware within that particular system. You've got the teacher, you've got the school, and then you've got government and policy behind that. So. It, when we turn to the corporate market, what we are looking at is a market where there's much more direct interaction. But there's some quite interesting observations that come out of that. Um, and what these lessons are is really looking at the different segments in it. And the first segment I wanted to look at is where we have, a, say, a product which is, or a service, which has the ability to be uh, delivered in a similar fashion in multiple different markets to multiple different types of people. And so looking at the IT training market, uh, it's very evident there that if you look on the pie chart on the left, you can see that already e-learning as a way of delivering training is already something that's been adopted uh, quite strongly within uh, the corporate market. There is still a very large portion that's done at a classroom level, uh, and we'll have a look at that. But IT training, because it's something which uh, doesn't, it sort of bypasses kind of the educational market from the perspective of certification and accreditation and has its own systems for doing that, means that it has been much more pervasive uh, within the market. And, you know, an example of that in terms of the, the real world is that you're probably familiar with a business called uh, lynda.com, uh, and lynda.com uh, has recently been acquired by LinkedIn uh, for about 1.5 billion. Um, and the importance of mentioning that is that, you know, that whole sector is growing up fast. And lynda.com uh, had about 300 million uh, uh, members uh, to its uh, system, but it shows kind of the direction of travel in the context of a business like LinkedIn, but how that fits into the training. And so I think what we'll see, particularly in, in IT, that this particular chart will start uh, to, for in terms of the green and e-learning, start to grow quite substantially over the coming years. But if we compare this by contrast to softer skills within the business market, uh, then looking at something like business skills, this is a, a, a kind of more thorny issue. And the reason being is that the skills that people are trying to bring across are things that are about management or uh, about HR-related issues or uh, trying to give people acumen from kind of their, their mentors within an existing organization. And historically, uh, that has been very much a classroom-based system and is still dominated uh, by that. And this is where I think technology is really going to make a change. And the reason being is that there's an example of a business that we're involved with uh, called Immerse. Uh, and what it does is it provides a 3D uh, virtual environment where live training can be uh, provided in that environment. Now, it can be quite sophisticated, so it can mock up, for example, an oil drilling rig, or it could mock up uh, uh, an aircraft, or uh, any forms of environment, and then provide 3D live uh, training within that environment and bring people from anywhere in terms of that classroom, bring teachers from anywhere into that environment. That 
technology, which is you know just the beginning of that journey, is technology that makes a difference in delivering some of those softer skills. So I think what's fascinating for us is is that in that market there are some very obvious pointers in terms of things like where there's IT services in Lynda.com, but there are also issues about how softer skills are coming into the market, but where we can see the journey that that technology is going to take us. So. Um, I think as we move on from um, uh, there, then what um, we're talking about is, is kind of what, what is there still to be done? And what we've taken away from today is, <coughs> as Benjamin took us through in terms of the kind of eight different parts of the education market, and I talked a little bit about the corporate market, the, the overall picture is one where uh, there is, as we've seen, a very large spend that's occurring in this market. The challenges within education is that the demand is increasing, but governments around the world are under budgetary pressure about how to deliver it. If you take in the US, the cost for students has been rising in terms of teaching and delivering in traditional method, and yet their performance, when you use, there are certain measures, there's one called PISA, which is used to measure relative performance of students around the world. What you see is that the US, although it spends the most per student, actually ranks, I think, about five or six on the PISA scores uh, in that same market. So the efficiency of the existing system is not working. Now that means that as we look at the digital environment, we can see these solutions. You can deliver learning in a personalized way, in a way that means something that is content that's relevant for each individual in a different way, that reflects the way that they learn, and you can use the data that we've been talking about you know, previously about cars, but the data about cars is, is, is one small aspect of a data about how we all learn. And as that data comes together, we can deliver very efficient mechanisms of educating uh, uh, people. That education is an education that is, is not compartmentalized just to the academic. It's, a, it's an education that extends into the working lives of people. And so what we're talking about is bringing skills that can effectively uh, bring lifelong skills. So lifelong learning is a phrase that you often hear in this, in this market. And that is something where as you look at kind of that shift, it doesn't require a, a big shift to digital to see the, the opportunity. But from a European perspective, we're missing out. And what we're trying to do is to elevate that voice in terms of promoting what's happening in, in that marketplace. Because if we don't, one of the big issues is that over the longer term, there is a competitive advantage that education and skills brings. Historically, the Western developed world has taken advantage of those skills to generate greater economic benefits for its citizens. But over the longer term, if we don't invest in those skills, what will happen is that competitive edge will be lost and other nations around the world, and we see where those investments are being made, will overtake and they will be flexible and more intelligent and more capable in terms of a workforce. And one of the ways of kind of measuring that is, but is that the fact that it's estimated that in 10 years' time, 60% of the jobs that will exist in 10 years' time have not yet been invented yet today. So there is a very flexible world that we have to respond to. And if we don't provide those skills and training both at the student level but also in the workplace, then our workforces will not be able to cope with this changing world. And so I think the thought that we want to leave you with is, is that we're trying to empower and bring that, con that connection within a European context. And you know, we, we, we set up an event particularly to drive that in London and, and again in, in Asia. Um, and what's important to us is to make sure that people are aware of the opportunities because from just really a commercial perspective, it's a big opportunity and one which will be driven by the same digital skills that we're talking about in terms of the generally in tech, which we're talking next door in terms of media. All of those skills are very relevant to the education market. So if you have any questions, please do come and up, uh, ask us afterwards. Um, but uh, we think this is an important issue and we'd like you to hopefully join in this EdTech conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.